We're very happy and elated to celebrate the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi by this international webinar on creating a culture of innovation and critical thinking lessons from Gandhi. Now I request Dr. G.P. Jayanti, Director, Research and Consultancy, Avinash Lingam Institute for Home Science and Higher Education for Women and convener of this webinar to welcome the gathering. A happy day to one and all. Mahatma Gandhi said, my life is my message. And he said that we can shake the entire world in a gentle way. In commemoration with the 150th birth anniversary of Gandhiji, the university grants commission, the apex body of higher education institutions in India, had planned a befitting activity for Indian universities to hold international lectures, symposia in collaboration with foreign universities with whom they have tie-ups to spread Gandhian thoughts and ideals far and wide. Today, we have one of those six international webinars jointly organized by the two universities, Avinashilingam Institute for Home Science and Higher Education for Women, Payambatu, Tamil Nadu, India, and Reading University, Reading United Kingdoms, who have signed MOU and are involved in many joint research activities. I extend my warm welcome to Dr. T.S.K. Meenakshi Sundaram Anna, Managing Trustee, Padmashri Dr. P.R. Krishna Kumar, Chancellor, Dr. Premavati Vijayan, Vice Chancellor, and Dr. S. Kausalya, Registrar of our University, who will also be now delivering the inaugural address. My hearty welcome to the speaker of the day, Dr. K. M. Venkat Narayan, Director, Imori Global Diabetes Center, Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology, Imori University, Atlanta, USA, who will be delivering a special lecture on creating a culture of innovation and critical thinking lessons from Gandhi. My pleasant welcome to Dr. Mohan, Director, MV Diabetes Research Foundation, Chennai, Dr. Rajeshekar, Director, Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore, Dr. Palanivel, Director, Jem Hospital, Coimbatore, Dr. Ramalingam, PhD Institute of Medical Sciences, Coimbatore, Dr. Hemalatta, Director, National Institute of Nutrition, and Dr. Shashikaran, former Director, NIN, and also other invitees. My hearty welcome to the Overseas Coordinator of the program, Dr. Vimal Karani, Associate Professor of Nutrigenetics and Nutrigenomics, University of Reading, Reading, UK, and the Host Institute Coordinator of the program, Dr. C.A. Kalpana, Associate Professor, Department of Food Science and Nutrition. I extend my warm welcome to the deans, heads of departments, and faculty members of Avinashalingam Institute, all the registered national and international participants and the team of participants from MV Diabetes Research Foundation India and also invitees from Shanti Ashram. We have participants registered from more than 10 countries and we are happy that our chief guest will share his views about Gandhiji. Welcome one and all. Thank you very much, Madam, for the warm welcome. I am pleased to invite Dr. S. Kausalya, Registrar of Avinashlingam Institute for Home Science and Higher Education for Women, to deliver the inaugural address. Good evening, everybody. Today, we have assembled online for a significant international webinar, jointly organized by Avinashlingam University and University of Reading, UK. My pronouns to our respected managing trustee Anna, Chancellor G, Vice Chancellor Madam, Honorable Dr. Venkat Narayan Sir, Director and Professor Imori University, Atlanta, USA, the Overseas Coordinator, Dr. Vimal Karoni, our Coordinator, Dr. C.A. Kalpana, 
deans of various schools of our university dr g p janti the convener of this significant international webinar dr vasuki raja dean home science dr tirumani professor and hod of food science and nutrition deans and professors and scholars representing uk usa india and other parts of the world globe totally representing 14 countries government of india through the higher education apex body university grants commission celebrates 150 years of celebrating the mahatma by holding symposia and lectures to 150 foreign universities jointly with reputed 150 indian universities today is the sixth lecture in the series by an eminent medical scientist and member of us national academy of medicine dr venkat narayan to all our friends across the globe i wish to say that our institute was founded by none other than dr ts avinashlingam avargal whom we affectionately address as ayya avargal and nurtured by dr rajamal p devdas a world renowned nutritionist and home scientist ayya a lawyer by profession emerged as a social reformer and freedom fighter we are fortunate to serve in this institution as our avinashlingam maya was the first education minister in the pre independent era covering andhra pradesh karnataka kerala and tamil nadu avinashlingam maya was a close friend of mahatma gandhi ji and ayya founded an institution for rural boys during 1930s and this institution the foundation stone was laid by mahatma gandhi ji yes ayya was also called as addressed by gandhi ji as avinashi 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 ayya also founded an institution for girls our avinashilingam institute the then sri avinashilingam home science college for women the trust was started in the school in 1952 and the college in 1957 now a dean to be university centrally funded by the mhrd through ugc we are proud to state to all other members and to our respected speaker that our institute ranked and won the arya award 2020 ranking number 1 in indian women institutions from the vice president of india last week for innovations and achievements a special mention of our speaker is that Dr Venkat Narayan sir was the recipient of the prestigious 43rd Gopalan Voration Award 2019 at the annual conference of Nutrition Society of India held at Rajiv Gandhi Institute Tiruvannadapuram and we all witnessed sir's brilliant lecture on back to the future historic roots of diabetes a uh, point to solutions at this juncture when we relate the principles of mahatma gandhi ji namely truth love for fellow men non violence ahimsa sarvodaya contentment simplicity and service to fellow men all this in the present pandemic covid 19 it is most befitting that doctor is addressing all of us on a brilliant topic creating a culture of innovation and critical thinking lessons from gandhi ji sir on behalf of avinashlingam institute for home science and higher education for women and university of reading uk and all members who have joined here from the medical fraternity nutrition fraternity once again i welcome and thank you sir for giving your valuable time to us to deliver this prestigious lecture in this international webinar named on gandhi ji Welcome and Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Jayanti, Dr. Kausalya, Dr. Kalpana. Uh, it is a real honor for me uh, to uh, to give this talk uh, to you know, which is honoring. Let me bring up my slides. Um, yeah, Dr. Professor Narayan. Um, uh, Can I take just a couple of minutes to introduce you to the audience? Sure, please do. Yeah, please do. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. 
I request uh, Dr. Vimal Karani to introduce the speaker and also to invite him to deliver the talk. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kalpana. Uh, first of all, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Professor Venkat Narayan, who is the director of Imori Global Diabetes Research Center and also a professor of epidemiology and medicine at the Imori University in Atlanta. Previously, he was a chief of the diabetes science branch at the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And prior to this, he was an intramural researcher at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, and also in the faculty at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. He is a physician scientist trained in internal medicine, geriatric medicine, and preventive medicine, and he specializes in the field of epidemiology and prevention of diabetes, obesity, and vascular diseases. Professor Narayan is noted for substantial multidisciplinary work in the field of diabetes and non-communicable diseases in relation to public health. He has been involved in several major national and international multi-center epidemiological studies, public health surveillance, translational research, and has conducted several intervention studies. And he's also currently exploring the differences in the pathophysiology of diabetes in South Asia and several other developing countries. With more than 400 publications, including several high impact studies, his work exemplifies his leadership in the field of diabetes and non-communicable diseases. Professor Narayan is a member of the United States National Academy of Medicine, and he's also the fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland, fellow of the Faculty of Public Health Medicine, United Kingdom, fellow of the American College of Physicians, and fellow of the American Heart Association. He won the American Diabetes Association's Kelly West Award for outstanding achievement in the field of epidemiology in the year 2015. And he won the Danish Diabetes Academy Visiting Professor Award for the years 2015 to 2017 and Government of India Jawaharlal Nehru Chair 2016 and Emory University's Mentor of the Year Award in 2011. Aside his professional accomplishment, Professor Narayan was also an invited civilian attendee at the National Security Forum by the Secretary of Air Force. And not to forget that, he was also the Duke of Edinburgh Commonwealth Fellow. So not taking too much of time, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Venkat Narayan for the special event of celebrating 150 years of Mahatma, which is being jointly organized by the Aminash Lingam University in India and the University of Reading, UK. So he's going to talk on the topic, creating a culture of innovation and critical thinking, lesson from Gandhi. This is indeed a very interesting subject and we are deeply interested and looking forward to hearing from you, sir. But before I hand over the session to you, a couple of announcements to everyone. Please mute your microphone and do not unmute your microphone during the lecture. And secondly, if you have any questions relating to the lecture, please type your questions in the chat box whether you're in the Zoom or in the YouTube link. Thank you once again, sir, for accepting the invitation, and I welcome you to deliver the talk, and the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vimal, uh, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Jayanti, Dr. Kalpana, Dr. Uh, Kausalya, for the very warm welcome. It is indeed my pleasure uh, to talk on this wonderful topic. Uh, when I think about it, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was probably the greatest human being uh, that lived in the 20th, 20th century, and his impact is worldwide. Here in Atlanta, he influenced Dr. Martin Luther King, and when you go to downtown Atlanta, you can see a statue of Mahatma Gandhi there. Gandhi's influence also extended to Nelson Mandela in South Africa, and when you go to Mexico City, you can see a road named after Gandhi. His influence has been worldwide. So when Vimal contacted me to give this wonderful talk, I felt very honored. And when I thought about it, what can I talk about this uh, uh, for this wonderful uh, 150th anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi? The more I thought about it, I realized that the 21st century is going to be an extremely global century, an international century, and also a century of knowledge, knowledge innovation, and empathy. I think those will have to define our 21st century if there is anything we need to bring together 
uh, seven, eight million billion people across the world into something very constructive. So I thought from my own perspective as a scientist, uh, talking about the culture of innovation and critical thinking uh, would be an interesting contribution. And also, the more I thought about it, I was able to uh, think in several ways about where Gandhi provides us very important lessons. Uh, this quote from Albert Einstein, generations to come, it may well be, uh, will scarce believe that such a man as this one ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth was how uh, Einstein uh, wrote when Gandhi was assassinated in 1948. Uh, Einstein, as you all know, was probably the greatest scientist, the greatest mind of the 20th century. And the very fact that Einstein should admire Mahatma Gandhi with such wonderful words should make us think that in many ways, Einstein was approaching science from a very humanistic perspective and Gandhi's humanism appealed to science. And what was also very common between the two of them was their ability to think innovatively, think out of the box, think creatively, and think in a way in which uh, their thinking and their approaches made an impact on humanity. I think this is where the connection between science and humanity, between inquiry and empathy becomes so evident. To understand Gandhi, we need to understand his mind. And several great authors, including Eric Erickson, and others have spent a lot of research understanding the psychology of Gandhi. How did Gandhi acquire his qualities and how, what really underpinned his entire emphasis? And having read some of these books and plus through my own thinking about Gandhi's characteristics, I was able to come up with a list of about 10 qualities that exemplifies Ga Gandhi. I'm sure some of you would think of other qualities but these 10 that I, I picked out from Gandhi's life, from the analysis of Gandhi from various psychologists, tell me that Gandhi has a lot to offer to the culture of thinking and to the culture of innovation and creativity. Number one, Gandhi's life was all about truth seeking. And this was the core of his idea, if you think about it. And this is where Gandhi's has so much to offer for innovation and science. His idea that truth is very important. He had a great deal of curiosity, and his curiosity really was what drove his empathy. If you think about it, if you want to develop empathy, we have to be curious. The more curious we are about other people, their cultures, their background, their lives, the more empathy we develop for them and for the world. Thirdly, Gandhi had a tremendous sense of imagination and also intuition, also very important qualities for innovation. Very importantly, Gandhi was willing to take on the impossible. So he was a risk-taking individual. He took on several calculated risks. Again, without risk, there is no innovation. He was an incurable optimist and was a very resilient person. So positive thinking was something that he always uh, characterized himself about. He had a very healthy ego. When you read his, his biographies and his autobiography, you see in him a very strong ego, which was healthy. There was a tremendous sense of self-confidence and self-belief, but he also countered it with a, with a quality of continuous learning, self-reflection and humility. He would wake up every morning, sit and meditate and think about all the mistakes he had made the previous day. He would end the evening with a prayer or a bhajan and think about how he had handled the day. And he was constantly trying to improve himself. He was a very clear, crisp, concise and motivating communicator which is extremely important in innovation and creativity. Finally, his vision was large and universal. Although he was very locally connected, his vision was very large and very universal. And in many ways, he exemplified leadership in, in several important dimensions. So when you read through Gandhi, there are several important quotes that suggest that he had been thinking about these things a lot. Here is a quote from him, solitude is the catalyst for innovation. And when you think about it, if you really want to come up with creative thoughts, you know, it, solitude is a wonderful thing. Yes, people might give us energy, but to think within ourselves, solitude is extremely important. And look at this quote, an error does not become truth by reason of multiplied provocation, nor does truth become error because nobody sees it. Truth stands 
even if there were even if there be no public support it is self sustained he was extremely a seeker of truth and he understand and he understood the importance of truth and why that was important here are a couple more quotes from gandhi freedom is not worth having if it does not include the freedom to make mistakes real creativity comes when people are free to make mistakes very important point and i keep saying we all you know create a culture where we like to celebrate successes perhaps if we really want a creative and innovative world we also need to celebrate failures because failures are extremely important and uh, to to because if you don't fail it means you're not trying every worthwhile accomplishment big or little has its stages of drudgery and triumph a beginning a struggle and a victory and when you really think about it a life of a scientist or a life of an innovator a lot of the work is drudgery routine boredom etc but there are moments of tremendous triumph there are beginnings there's a long long period of struggle and there are victories so i think understanding this so gandhi clearly was able to understand these roles these important qualities that are needed for innovation let's now switch to what is innovation and before we do that what is invention invention is the creation of the idea or the method itself but innovation refers to use of a new idea or a method so that is the distinction and you can sit in solitude and invent something or create something but what makes that innovation is your ability or not to take that to the field to make that idea grow and to have an impact and therefore innovation is the creation of better or more effective products processes services technologies or ideas that are accepted by the markets governments and society and in this when you really think about it gandhi was a real genius when it came to taking a creative idea and taking it to the masses one example that exemplifies this is the salt march think about it he comes out of prison after many years quietly you know sits in solitude somehow gets inspired just by looking at the sea about the idea and the importance of salt to the pulse of the nation he also identifies that the taxation against salt was oppressing a lot of people in india and he somehow invents his entire idea of a march that would last 22 days uh, and would unite the country in a very big way he was very symbolic about the purpose of salt and he was also very symbolic on the day he arrives in amritsar uh, uh, on the on the uh, on the on the anniversary of the massacre uh, in jallianwala bagh so it was beautifully strategically carried out and what was amazing was the momentum that he created brought together millions of people from across the country as a grassroots movement and even at the end even when he was arrested the movement would not stop this is a very important quality of an innovator and a leader where one makes oneself redundant and the movement is not dependent on that person this is a very important quality that gandhi always showed and when you read his biography you realize every time something took away took off gandhi was ready to move away from it and allow others to lead the, the the movement symbolically when india became independent gandhi did not attend the the independence day celebration he was somewhere in in, in bengal trying to put out riots so the man had the ability to distance himself from the fruits of his labor he paid a great deal of attention to the process so what is needed for innovation you clearly need a lot of individual characteristics like i have described and in addition you'd need a strong institutional culture that promotes innovation promotes uh, risk taking promotes failure accommodates uh, and is tolerant about different ways of thinking you also need a culture that connects great ideas with great people with great resources i often keep saying that anybody is capable of high potential but you have to identify their potential acknowledge their ideas and connect them with resources sometimes very small amount of resources connected with the right idea and the right people can have a very powerful impact you definitely need an interdisciplinary culture we need 
a sense of borderlessness where we are trying to uh, you know, get into other areas, other disciplines, where you're building trust with one another and building a sense of partnership across organizations, across people. And many great ideas often come from other disciplines. This is something very important. We might think we are diabetologists or we are nutritionists or whatever we are, but it is important to be sensitive to other disciplines and to learn from them. A lot of biology you know, got ideas from physics, a lot of statistics got ideas from agriculture and so on and so forth. We have to break out of our comfort zones. As human beings, we tend to become very comfortable in what we are doing and we don't want to step out of it because it's routine, it's very comfortable, we have our own peer groups, but it is important to break out of that comfort zone and get criticized, take some risks and, and explore it for ourselves, which means we need a culture that rewards risk and we also need a culture that creates that special type of leadership uh, that is so important for innovation and creativity. That brings me to the topic of what is creativity. So think about it. Here, is, here are data about age and creative potential, a simple question of how many different ways could a, a problem be solved or a puzzle be solved or, 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 or some, some question be asked. When you study children aged until the age of four to five, 98% of children, all of us, all our children, all of us, have the ability to explore questions without any inhibition, to come up with ideas and, and solutions without any, any inhibition. So we are all born geniuses. And then see what happens. By age 10, only 30% of people still retain that ability. By age 15, only 10% of people retain that ability. And by age 30, less than 2% of people retain that ability. So what we do is we are born geniuses, but there is something about social norms, education systems, I don't know what it is. It begins to inhibit people as they grow older. And this is a bit of a tragedy. And this is again somewhere very interesting. When you read Gandhi's experiments with his truth and his other books, you begin to realize that Gandhi retained the child in him all along. He always had a very sharp sense of humor. He was very quick and he was naive in a certain sense. And look at that smile in Gandhi's face, very childlike. And this was a quality that he preserved. He had it right till the day he died. And he was also very clear with his, with his message to the world. If we are to teach real peace in this world, and if we are to carry on a real war against war, we shall have to begin with children. And that is true if we have to create a culture of creativity, a culture of innovation, a culture of risk-taking, we have to approach our children. We have to make them fearless about losing, make them you know, self-confident. At the same time, uh, make them acquire a sense of humility. These are very important in education systems, in parenting, societal norms, peer pressure. All of this needs, needs to accommodate, uh, accommodate uh, creativity and innovation. So when you think about it, what are the, how does the mind work when it comes to creativity and thinking? All of us do two types of thinking. One was what we call divergent thinking. These are dreams, imagination, nonlinear way of thinking, lateral processing. The second is what we call convergent thinking, very linear, very orderly, making a decision, choosing something and judging. Unfortunately, as children, we do a lot of divergent thinking. We are, we are born with a lot of divergent thinking. Look at the questions children ask. They ask beautiful questions. But then as we grow, we develop a sense of right, wrong, good, bad, and we judge, we criticize others. Uh, we, we, you know, we want somebody else to be just like us. So we start developing a lot more uh, convergent thinking. Education systems are based on tests, scores, uh, failing, passing, you know, we, this is how we start judging people. So we end up sacrificing divergent thinking for the sake of convergent thinking. And we start losing creativity. And if we want to bring back innovation and creativity in, into our systems and into our societies, we have to promote divergent thinking and more creative thinking. This is a beautiful quote from Albert Einstein who said, creativity is the residue of time wasted. You know, Einstein was probably one of the most creative human beings of the last century. 
and he valued the importance of wasting time. But yet, we tend to bring up children, we tend to create a culture where we don't tolerate people wasting time. Wasting time is at the heart of creativity, at the heart of innovation. When, Ga when Gandhi sat by himself every morning between four and six meditating, or late in the evening by himself, you could argue he was wasting time. But, he, but what he was basically doing, he was recharging his brains, he was coming up with new ideas, he was trying his own methods, and that is what he was doing all along. And that's exactly what Einstein did when he went for his walks in, in Princeton or, or, or sat by himself, uh, you know, enjoyed nature, etc. So how do you enhance creativity uh, in an organization or in individuals? The first important thing that you need to create is a safe space. You need to create a space where people can sit together and talk anything they want without being judged. They can talk stupid, you know, there is no such thing as a stupid idea. Every great idea from a genius was once a stupid idea. So we can either shut it off as a stupid idea or we can in indulge in it, allow it to grow. And you don't know, a hundred stupid ideas might generate uh, one great idea or a thousand stupid ideas might generate one, one great idea. Let's provide that space for it and let, let's provide time for people to indulge in these games, etc. Creating time to unwind, uh, unwind and reflect, very important. So each of us needs to find a place or a time or even within organizations. Let's say Saturday morning, we are having these two hours, safe space for enhancing creativity. Let people come down, sit, unwind, reflect, joke, and you don't know what's going to come out of it. You need to create an environment that is uninhibited and non-judgmental, especially when you're brainstorming. When people are throwing ideas, let them throw ideas, write it out on a board. Don't judge them as this will work, that won't work. We all have the quality to do that. Don't do it. Let, let, let all the ideas flow. Let them be on a board. And then come to decide as to which are important, which are not. But don't judge ideas when they're being generated. Borrowing from other disciplines and fields is very important. Creating a culture of risk-taking is important. And you have to instill in people a sense of passion. So if somebody has a passion for something, let them pursue it rather than you saying, oh, this passion will not get you anywhere, do the other thing. Let, let each person uh, you know, identify their passion. Promote curiosity. When you meet somebody, try to understand their lives, try to understand why they're asking you something rather than shutting them off. Ask, let, let people talk. Skepticism. When there is an idea, yes, when there is idea or a way of doing things, always question it. Questioning is very important. All of this is really connected to creating a culture of change. Because when you think about it, innovation, creativity, etc., is about changing things. It's not so that we are not held to status quo. We try to create a better world. We try to create better technologies, better processes, et cetera. And you can apply innovation to any kind of life, to any kind of uh, uh, you know, goals in life. This is a beautiful quote from Philip Crosby, one of the great thinkers in the idea of quality improvement. And this is what he says. If anything is certain, it is that change is certain. The world we are planning today will not exist in this form tomorrow. And this idea that change is the only constant is something that the ancient Indian literature in, in the Upanishads and Vedas, it's spoken about a lot, that the only constancy that we have is change. So we have to embrace change as something that is always going to happen. And Gandhi was very clear about this. He said, be the change you want to see in this world. So if you want to promote a certain change, you have to embrace it yourself. And so he, his experiments with truth was about how do you, you know, become more, a more truthful person? And he engaged, you know, nonviolence does not come easily to people, but he practiced it. He thought about it. He read about it. He sought mentors. He was constantly trying to start by changing himself before changing others. But yet, when you think about it deeply from a psychological perspective and a sociological perspective and a societal perspective, the usual reactions to change or perceived change are the following resistance, fear, and fear of losing control. You know, fear is a very ugly quality. It, we need it to survive, but when it is in excess, it becomes dangerous to ourselves, it limits our growth, and it also creates violence in, in humans. It makes people angry, it makes 
it, it creates violence in society. And the worst kind of fear is a fear of losing control or losing power. Like somebody said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. But the worst of all this is the fear of losing power, which really removes all sense of empathy and morality. So I think somehow we, have to, we can't have innovation until we also promote empathy and, and the ability to deal with change in a measured, empathetic way uh, and to understand it in a way in which we promote both cooperation and competition to coexist. Here, let's look at the history of scurvy and world exploration. And very interesting story put together by my colleague, Don Berwick. In 1497, Vasco de Gama uh, sailed, he took four ships to India. And 100 out of the 160 sailors uh, you know, died at the ship. Sorry, this was one ship in, in 1497. In 1601, Captain Lancaster was also going to India. So he took four ships with him. And in one ship, he administered lemon juice to all the sailors. This was because there had been an idea in England that lemon juice somehow will protect people from scurvy. Scurvy was what was causing this death, vitamin C deficiency. And in the other three ships, he deliberately did not provide any lemon juice. So in the ship that lemon juice was given to all the sailors, nobody died. But in the three ships where there was no juice provided, 110 out of 278 sailors died. So Lancaster concluded that lemon juice was protective against scurvy and protective against sailors dying during their long voyage from England to India. But yet it was 1747 that the British Navy repeated the citrus observations uh, in, their, in, their, in, in people you know, going, you know, sailing to India and other countries. And it was 1796 that the British Navy ordered the citrus diet. And it was 1865 that the British Board of Trade made this a policy to provide citrus juice to all sailors when they were sailing uh, long distances and taking on long voyages. It took 264 years from the time of a creative idea, citrus juice or lemon juice, to it becoming policy took 264 years. So what can we understand? So about diffusion of innovations. A great idea for it to spread follows this kind of a curve. It's a sigmoid curve where the number of people adopting that idea is on the y-axis and the time it takes is on the x-axis. In the case of uh, uh, the sailors and citric acid, it took citric juice, it took 264 years. In the case of most innovations, it takes 20 years, 30 years longer. So what do we know about it? Firstly, there is a distribution of, uh, of the types of personalities in society. The innovators, the people who start something new, are a minority. They're about 2% or one standard deviation or less in, in a society or, on a, or in a particular context. Then there are people who are early adopters. There are people who, when somebody starts a new idea, they're ready to try it. Then there are the, late, the, the early majority. Once something catches on 20%, a lot of people want to follow and it starts becoming fashion. And then there is a late majority, then it spreads through society. And then there is a the question of laggards. There's always 15 or 20% who will never adopt a new idea, will never change. And there is a great book by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point, which describes this phenomenon. So we need to understand this and Gandhi really understood it. So whenever he had a great idea, he experimented with it, with it, with it and then he brought in some early adopters, and then he let the, uh, the, the idea spread. You can study how the salt march was orchestrated, was strategized. This phenomenon is very clear, and this can be true of any fashion. It can be true of uh, a song. It can be true of selling a new product. We need to understand this, but all of us get frustrated. Innovators get frustrated. Others are not accepting it, but we need to understand how to sell this gradually through the system. So, how do you do it? First, we have to invest in sound innovations. So the, I, mean, I just spoke to you briefly about how you can create a culture of innovation uh, or an institution of innovation. Then you need to find and support those innovators. You know? And many innovators are thought to be troublemakers, but you need them. They're thought to be people who are, who are you know, disturbing the status quo, but we need them. 
but you need a small number of them because most people are not, don't have that quality or don't want to be in that quality. You need to invest in the early adopters who are ready to support the innovators and take things to the next stage. You need to make early adopter activity observable. Early successes, talk about it, promote it, tweet it, etc., so that others hear about it, blog it. You need to trust and enable reinvention. Accept that every new idea is likely to fail. How do you recreate it? How do you? And then you need to create slack and for change and creativity, provide time. So you need all of this. You need to create a, a, an organization that is able to withstand all of this. A lovely quote from Woody Allen. There are those who make change happen. There are those who watch change happen. And there are those who sit and wonder what the hell has happened. So you're going to have all kinds of people in society. But importantly, we need them all. We need them all in some capacity. So you need to understand who plays what role. How do you accommodate it? How do you create an organization where somebody who is capable of innovation leads in one, one, one area, somebody who is an early adopter begins to take over, and also, if you're an innovator, accept the fact that you may not stay in the game till the whole thing goes to the market or becomes popular. So like somebody said, an old African saying, that the idea of innovation is to plant a seed under whose tree you do not expect to enjoy yourself. This is where diversity in teams is very important. In any team, you need these three types of people. You need the innovators who are rare, who are few, who are about 2% of people, who are the troublemakers. You don't want to give them the responsibility of running things or responsibility of doing things that, uh, that they don't enjoy. You need to allow them the freedom to think, to put out new ideas. And then you also need the conservers. These are people who are the naysayers, who say something can't be done. Because these are the people who make sure an organization will not get into trouble or an innovator will not commit a great mistake and have to go to prison or something like that. So the, you need those people to, to caution. But they need to do it in a way that you don't stifle the innovator. Uh, but very importantly, in the middle, which is about 80% of people, you need the pragmatists. The pragmatists are people who know how to get things done, who know how to run an organization, but who are empathetic about the innovator. They know their value. Yeah, so starting back again, in any team, you need a diversity of people. You need the innovators, you need the pragmatists, you need the conservers. But what is important is you need leadership that develops tolerance between the three people. You don't want the conservers to stifle or uh, belittle the innovator. You don't want the conservers to feel that they are naysayers all the time. So you need that kind of intelligent leadership that accommodates different people and gives them their different space. Uh, my slides are getting stuck. I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, then the, the other very important thing in a changing culture or innovative culture is resilience. Because when change happens, people start feeling stressed. They start feeling threatened. So you have to develop a sense. They start you know, worrying about the future. So you need a, a, a psychology of resilience. And these are five qualities that are very important for us as individuals to develop resilience and for organizations to develop resilience. Being positive, focusing on the important, like you can think of a number of things at one time, but you need to focus on the very important thing quickly. You need to be organized with information. I can have a lot of data in my mind, a lot of information in my mind, but in any context, we should be able to reorganize that information in such a way that it is useful for that particular environment. If I'm speaking to a scientist, I organize the information one way. If I'm speaking to the press, I organize it in another way. Very important. Being flexible, extremely important, and being proactive. If you take action before something happens, these five qualities are things that you can acquire. Some people are good at it, but all of us can acquire it. The other big idea that we need to remember from Gandhi and others is this whole thing about zero sum which is about you lose, you, I win, you lose, or you win, I lose, win, lose kind of thinking, very competitive nature to non-zero sum, where we start thinking in a win-win way, where everybody can win, there is space for everybody. So one is a very linear way of thinking, zero sum, win, lose. Uh, the other one is a non-zero sum. How do you create a culture where there is something positive for everybody to gain? 
you don't have to compete on, and if you, when you analyze human civilization, about two thirds of human progress has come from non-zero thinking, whereas some progress has come from wars, et cetera, but those are unfortunate. And this is where non-violence becomes very critical, the idea of non-zero thinking. And Gandhi was a master at this. Look at this wonderful quote. When the rest of the people, Jinnah, Nehru, Patel, others, were arguing about a revolution, uh, and, it, and they were okay about if it hurt the, uh, the British, this is what Gandhi had to say. He was ready to call off the revolution if there was any violence on the side of the Indians. This was his quote. We have come a long way with the British. When they leave, we want to part with them as friends. So he understood that after independence, India should maintain a sense of cooperation with the British and, help, and the two sides to help, should help each other rather than remembering, yes, there is a lot of talk about how the British may have uh, destroyed India, how they may have exploited India. All that is valuable. But I think we need to get past it. There might be a lot of truth in how some of the Islamic invasions in India may have created disturbances in India. All of that might be true, it's fine to record it, but we need to get past it. I think the importance is that history might tell us where we have come from, but it does not tell us where we are going to go. If we need to understand where we have to go, we have to develop the attitude of forgetting the worst aspects of the past and move forwards. I think this is where a book from Nelson Mandela, The Long Walk to Freedom, is a beautiful book. Every 10 pages will make you feel touched by his sense of forgiveness. So forgiveness is a very important quality if you want need to be a leader. Talking about the past and seeking revenge is not the way of creating a new, a better society. And I think many parts of the world today, unfortunately, are going through this idea of nativism and being unforgiving about others. We have to get past that. There is no others. It's all of us are here together in this world and in the space of each country. Nationalism is a bad idea. I think we are a global civilization. Quality has to be caused. It cannot be controlled. And here again, Gandhi was wonderful. He did not try to control or impose ideas. He generated quality by creating a culture, by setting an example. So let me, before I finish, briefly touch on the qualities of leadership. There are two types of leadership. One, leadership for a routine situation. This is more of management, where you define a problem, you provide a solution to a person, you try to protect the person from, you know, from you know, making, uh, you know, getting into trouble. If there is some loss of order, you try to restore order. You make rules very clear. You do that, you do this, uh, and, you, and you maintain a norm. This routine situation works very well in certain situations like factories, uh, in certain situations like agricultural production, manufacturing industries, when you're head of a large nursing organization, uh, when you're in the army, et cetera, when you're running a, a war, et cetera. But leadership in an innovation culture or in a complex culture, in a changing culture, needs to be different. In a revolutionary culture, needs to be different. And Gandhi actually exemplified many of that, a very adaptive leadership style, where, he, where his style was more of identifying the adaptive challenges. We need freedom. He would frame the questions and just leave and, and provide some examples and stories and let others uh, think about some solutions. He was good. He did not protect people. You know, when people marched and they got arrested, he was not ready to protect them. He allowed people to take their risks. When there was conflict, when there were differences of opinion between Gandhi and uh, uh, Nehru and Jinnah or Patel and Nehru or whoever, uh, or Bose and somebody else, he did not try to manage it. He allowed them to argue and, 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 and come together. Uh, he, he challenged the current roles. Uh, you know, he, he basically, he questioned, you know, even when he came to return to India from South Africa, he questioned how the Indian National Congress was operating and he decides to go through India, discovering India, et cetera. He resisted telling Congress how they should change, but he basically questioned what they were doing and things started changing. He didn't shape the norms, he challenged the unproductive norms. So these were some of the important adaptive qualities we need to develop 
as adaptive leaders, as innovative leaders. And finally, critical thinking is extremely important. And Gandhi, when you read his book, Experiments with Truth, showed his ability to constantly criticize himself, his ways. And he was always querying how he was doing things, how he can do things better. He queried about whether he should try non-vegetarian food. Then he felt guilty about it. And every time there was something would go wrong, he would question it. He was, uh, you know, he questioned his childhood. He questioned his relationship with his parents. He questioned his relationship with his wife. He was constantly criticizing himself. So here was this, when you think about critical thinking, it's the process of thinking uh, that, that questions uh, assumptions. You question assumptions. Uh, he questioned Brahminism and, and the oppression of lower caste in India. He, questioned, he opened up the temples for, uh, you know, for everybody in India. So there was definitely a, an element of critical thinking and questioning in his ways. Uh, it's, it's a way of deciding whether a claim is true, false, sometimes true, or, some, or partly true. And when you think of critical thinking, its origins go, goes back to Greece in Socratic thinking of ancient, of ancient Greece. And in India, the period of Buddhism, and even before that, there was a lot of critical thinking. Here is a quote from Buddha. Believe in nothing, no matter where you read it or who has said it, not even if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. The core here is you question it and you bring reason into it. Reason was very, is very important. You know, it is very easy. Like somebody said, everybody is entitled to their opinion, but nobody is entitled to their facts. Facts and reason are hard commodities. You can't create them. And this is, again, something with this whole era of fake news and, and illusion of, uh, of truth. This is an area we need to bring back the importance of reason, empathy, argument, uh, without violence, where you can disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, a beautiful quote from Mark Twain, education is the path from cocky ignorance to miserable uncertainty. So the more you learn, the less certain you become. And again, when you, when you read Freedom at Midnight, the last few months of Mahatma Gandhi, particularly read essays about his last few days, the man suffered a considerable level of uncertainty about himself, what he had done. He was very disturbed about the Hindu-Muslim violence. He was very concerned about the way the country was changing. He was very concerned about his role or not his role. So he was clearly a man who uh, you know, was willing to embrace uncertainty, question himself, a very important quality. And finally, Gandhi was very lucky that in that he embraced a number of mentors. And when you talk of mentors, we often think in concrete terms about real people, but these could be people you read about. These could be people that, you, that have touched you in different conversations, in different speeches. You've met them somewhere, in their writings, etc. So Gandhi had some tremendous mentors, Henry Thoreau, uh, Leo Tolstoy. Gandhi was very touched by Jesus of Nazareth and his Sermon on the Mount. He paid a great deal of attention to Bhagavad Gita and of Krishna uh, in Bhagavad Gita. He was touched by the character of Rama and Ramayan. And, and Gopal Krishna Gokhale was a very important mentor when Gandhi returned from South Africa to India. And when, when Gandhi died, several of these books uh, were all that he had. Uh, you know, so those books were very important uh, in any Gandhi exhibition. You can go to uh, uh, you know, Kanyakumari. Uh, to the Gandhi Memorial, you'll see copies of the books. You can go to uh, the Gandhi Exhibition Hall in Martin Luther King, you'll see some of these books. Uh, so recently, I was reading an essay on mentorship, and I want to you know, think you know, briefly about that. There are a few laws of mentorship, and mentorship is extremely important, both for ourselves as individuals and for us to impart to others. And mentorship requires the following laws. The law of positive environment. The role of a mentor is to create a positive environment where potential and motivation are released and options are discussed. The law of developing character, where you nurture a positive character by helping to develop more than just talent, also a wealth of mental and ethical traits. The law of independence, where you promote autonomy, make the mentee independent of you, not dependent on you. The law of limited responsibility, they are responsible to them, not for them. Very important. The law, the law of shared mistakes. You are happy to share your failures as well as your successes. 
you're not scared. The law of planned objectives, where you prepare specific goals for your relationship, and relationship changes over time. The way you treat a three-year-old kid is very different from the way you treat a 10-year-old, is very different from the way you treat a 20-year-old or a 40-year-old, etc. So even the parent-child relationship, the grandchild-child, you know, grandchild relationship changes over time. The law of inspection, monitor, review, provide feedback, discuss potential actions, and do not expect performance without inspection, both self-inspection and inspection in general. The law of small successes, use a stepping stone process to build on accomplishment and achieve great success. So praise small successes, celebrate it, reward it. Don't wait till the end of life for a li you know, lifetime achievement. You know, every day, let's, let's praise important things. Let's also criticize things where people can improve in. The law of direction. It is important to teach by giving options as well as direction, little direction. The law of mutual protection, where you have to maintain privacy, very important. Protect the integrity, character, and the insights that you have shared with one another. Two people sharing something is sacred. Don't share it with anybody. If somebody tells you something about somebody else, it is fine. Keep it to yourself. Don't have to share it. It doesn't have to be public. It doesn't have to be shared with other people. The law of communication, mentors and their mentees must balance listening and speaking. Very important. And listening has to be active. The law of life transition. As mentors, when you help your mentees enter the next stage of their lives, you will also enter the next stage of yours. Very important. So mentor and mentee, we grow with each other. This idea that I am old and I cannot learn is not correct. We learn all the time. Till the day we die, we learn and we change till the day we die. And finally, the law of fun. If you're going to live on this planet for a very short time, let's make mentoring a wonderful experience. Laugh, smile, enjoy the journey. Uh, and this is where I want to point to you, you know, this wonderful book on mentoring, uh, uh, you know, which you might want to uh, read yourself or, or you know, either on the, on, the, on the internet or get a copy of. Finally, before I conclude, my own personal tips. These have worked for me. Uh, generally, in life, if you want to be innovative, uh, if you want to be creative, if you want to be skeptical, you have to read widely, often outside of your main areas of work and interest. Very important. Reading is a great habit. It actually connects us with the world. You have to remain constantly curious, skeptical, and question everything to get to the fundamentals. Even the most obvious thing, question it so that you understand it for yourself and you make it understood for the next person. Continuously debate with oneself, argue with yourself and with others to stay free of prejudices and to learn and innovate and to build a network of people to debate with. Very important, very extremely important to create a community of argument. You know, if you, when you read Amritya Sen's book, The Argumentative Indian, this idea of argument is very much part of India's old culture. The Upanishads really is a set of arguments about the lessons in the Vedas, about the, uh, about the messages in the various, those were debated. They were the Nasikas and the Asikas. You know, we were willing to question. I think we need that kind of a culture. Personal tips, again, continue from my own. Combine humility with confidence, very important, it's very similar to what Gandhi said. Go to the balcony often and look at the big, big picture, the importance of solitude. It can be space to yourself. I get a lot of this when I swim just by myself for an hour and off, you know, or, or just go to go and watch a lake or a river or see trees. It gives you a lot of an, in, insight into yourself. Enjoy the race, but be indifferent to the results and to the credits. The credits and the results will come. If they don't come, don't worry about it. It'll come to you. If it goes to somebody else, let it go to somebody else. Surround yourself with bright, motivated, questioning people, positive people, negative people are a problem. Select them carefully, learn from them, mentor them, let them mentor you, coach them, let them coach you. Don't allow groupthink to set in. Avoid attending too many ta canned talks or large conferences or courses or regular festivals or routines. These, these all they do is they create group think and make everybody conform. It, it, you start losing your sense of creativity or questioning. So create 
don't be part of the same group all the time. You know, be part of several groups, be part of yourself, so that you have a diversity in, 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 in your interactions. Don't let conventions, norms, societal rules come in the way. In fact, when you think about it, every convention, every norm basically hides the truth. Expose it, fully expose it, even if it is uncomfortable to yourself and others, expose it. Try something new every day. It can be something simple. Read a new essay, meet a new person, think about a new culture, etc. There's always so much more that you can learn just by thinking about new things. Finally, to conclude with Gandhi's quotes, glory lies, glory lies in the attempt to reach one's goal, not in reaching it. You're never going to reach your goal, but you can enjoy the journey and this is extremely important. Like Gandhi said, what you're doing is not important, but it is very important that you do it. So developing that attitude is extremely important. And finally, if I have the belief that I can do it, I shall surely acquire the capacity to do it, even if I may not have, have it at the beginning. So just because you don't have the capacity or you think you don't have the capacity, don't avoid attempting it. Acquire the belief, ask people, develop your network, read widely, and learn a way to do it. Thank you very much, uh, and I'm now open to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, that was an uh, enlightening and an entertaining presentation, and I'm sure everyone will agree that this presentation will add another feather to the rich historical legacy of 150 years of Mahatma. And thank you so much, sir. Let's uh, start with a few questions. And um, so as mentioned before, please uh, post all your questions in the chat box, whether you're in the Zoom or in the YouTube. So uh, my, my first question is about like, what is your view on uh, Mahatma Gandhi's philosophies in relation to the times of COVID-19 crisis? Yeah, very good question, if anything. I think what the COVID-19 crisis has done, it's, it's actually begun to sh shine a torch on many important things. Firstly, it's highlighted to us that a, like a virus can travel across the world anywhere, information can travel anywhere. So in a sense, we are a global civilization. I think that's a very important idea. Uh, the idea of internationalism is something that's become very obvious. The fact that we are a global village has become very obvious. It is also highlighted to us about local action uh, being important. I think that, that is very important. Then more importantly, uh, what COVID has highlighted to us is that our way of life and lifestyle, the, the, the diseases of non-communicable diseases like diabetes, obesity are so important. And for this, Gandhi's idea of preserving a lifestyle where we exercise, paid attention to our nutrition, et cetera, uh, is extremely important. So too, when you think about it, Gandhi's idea that you know, we, can sat we, we, can't sat we can satisfy everybody's needs, but we can't satisfy everybody's greed is a very important idea. When we create a global culture where a small number of people or a small percentage of people have a huge amount of wealth and a large number of people are without wealth, you create a dangerous civilization uh, is also something it has brought out because COVID affects the most poor people it affects the people with chronic diseases. It affects people who are not uh, you know, stress-free or physically fit, et cetera. And also, it also tells us you're not safe. If you don't look after your neighbor, you're not safe. You, you walk on the road, you might think this is a disease of a poor person, but you, you are exposed to everybody. So it's basically telling us, pay attention to others. And the other thing it's telling us is that all the technology and science is wonderful, but you also need empathy and something that Gandhi did not say, but I think as a large global civilization we need is strong institutions. So it basically Gandhi's ideas of nonviolence, empathy, global thinking, thinking about the other person, uh, you know, making our, simplifying our own life, not allowing uh, you know, greed to, uh, you know, to take over our, other people's need, uh, creating a sense of equality. I think all of that I think are extremely important. To solve problems, you have to have conversation. Otherwise, we, we you know, I don't think we want to have, you know, create a, a vaccine war between country, countries. We want to cooperate. I think so. A number of things. I think what Gandhi said is very true. 
uh, and I think COVID really brings it out. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. And um, I have a couple of questions from um, Dr. Kausalya from the Avinash Lingam University. So the first question is, are Gandhiji's um, ideals suitable and applicable only to Indian societies? Can they also be applied to Western population? And if we try to apply them, will they accept it? Yeah, firstly, in the year, two, in the year 2000, when the Time magazine ran the person of the century, across the world, the person who was voted number one was Mahatma Gandhi. So he was regarded worldwide. And when you read the history of Gandhi's impact, he started his early experiments of uh, so, you know, nonviolent social change in South Africa. And that legacy continued later. Nelson Mandela initially did not follow a nonviolent method, but later Nelson Mandela was in fact sent to prison for 20, 20 odd years. Uh, and then later he embraced nonviolence. So that it was a nonviolent struggle that won South Africa you know, freedom from apartheid. And also Nelson Mandela, the first president with a majority black, had he not followed Gandhian approaches, there would have been bloodbath in that country. But through the nonviolent movement, somehow the whites were not threatened and things came together. In the United States, the blacks in the United States were a minority, but they were able to mobilize nonviolent methods thanks to Martin Luther King, and there were arguments against him. Malcolm X, for example, argued against Martin, Martin Luther King's methods, but that's, that prevailed. And so nonviolence produced a great deal of change. And this has happened you know, you know, in, in Afghanistan, uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, it's happened in Egypt, you know, and Nazir and, and Sadat. Sadat particularly embraced, he went to the Neset at the height of war to embrace a peace treaty which still holds between Egypt and, and Israel. So I think this idea of Gandhian methods has, been, uh, has actually had an impact worldwide. It's time for us to rediscover it. And sometimes I feel a little sad because India, in, in one way, the country of Buddha and the country of Gandhi, in sometimes India goes through this phase of losing it. How did the country of Gandhi and nonviolence in India break into such violence post-partition? And why is there today in India over the last 10, 10 years, 20 years, et cetera, a growing sense of unrest across religions or communities? I think these are questions we should ask ourselves. And I believe the Gandhian way is a much superior way because it forces you to think of empathy first, cooperation first, and the ability not to other the other person, but think of the, all of us as part of the same common human civilization. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question from Dr. Kausalya. So what are your views on brain drain? Because Gandhiji himself has spent several years in foreign countries. Yeah, good question. You know, I myself have often reflected on this because I've lived out of India since 1980. Soon after finishing medicine from St. John's Medical College, I left India. But I think there was another little quote or a, in a graffiti that I read that brain in the drain is worse than brain drain. So in other words, so in a sense, this is where I think we need to think carefully on two very important axes. Number one, if you don't want brain drain, every country has to create the opportunities for those brains to thrive and innovation to thrive. So that's one thing. So if you want to, the best way of, of retaining talent is to provide an environment where the talent can thrive, number one. Secondly, migration and exchange of people is important. I mean, Gandhi himself, you could argue, learned a lot by going to UK, where he did his uh, training in Bar, then his time in South Africa, and then he brought back some methods. So I think that exposure is extremely important. Gandhi was an expat. I think he lived out of India for 26 years, I think, and he returns to India in his late 40s. So I think that can be important. So I don't think we should see it as brain drain. You need bi-directional flow of, inf of people. I mean, just like we want people from India to go to other countries, you need a lot of people from other countries to come to India. So that welcome exchange is important. And mm -hmm. once again, one of the great quotes that Gandhi said, he said, my life is like a house and a room with all windows open, where breeze flows from all directions. But I will embrace all the, all the breeze and all the ideas that come in, but I will not lose my roots. I think that is important. So I think whether you're uh, 
thinking of Indian ways, thinking in India or elsewhere. I, I think we need to break down barriers and borders to the extent we can. Okay, thank you, thank you, sir. And um, there's another question. Um, how much can we implement Gandhi's ideas to, um, to our country, that India, given the current situation where we are facing several political problems? Yeah, a very good question. And again, you know, when you think about it, in about what creates a culture of, of nonviolence, for example, let's think of the positive. Rather than saying, how do you reduce violence, let's talk about how do you create a culture of nonviolence. It really boils down to a culture of innovation, creativity, critical thinking, empathy. So how do you create that, which is what I tried to reflect on. But fundamentally, one important quality is the tone that a leader sets or leadership sets. If a leader sets the tone of cooperation, of empathy, we are all in this together, it has a powerful influence on people. And secondly, we need to develop a zero tolerance for hatred. You know, when hatred comes up, it's natural human quality. But I think the, the role of a leader is not to uh, oppress hatred or to suppress hatred, but to use that opportunity as a teaching moment to say, okay, by hating somebody else, you're actually harming yourself and your group. Whereas by reaching out, you can learn a lot. And, and really the beauty of India, when you think about Indian civilization, India, you know, you can go back to the first people who migrated into Indian subcontinent 70, 80,000 years ago, uh, et cetera. It has witnessed numerous migrations, numerous people from Greece, from Persia, from uh, from the, the Vedic civilization, the indigenous people. It's, it's actually, uh, you know, it's been the place given birth to so many different religions. It's embraced Christianity from 52 AD with St. Thomas. Islam came to India during the life of Prophet Muhammad through trade routes in a very peaceful way. India has been a very rich culture. And I think we should celebrate that richness rather than looking at differences. When you really think about it, what unites us is far more important than what separates us. If you've got 20, 100 people in a room from across uh, gender, age, religion, and you ask them, what are the five or six most important things to you? We all come up with the same things. So I think we need to promote that. And I think it's creating that culture, creating that leadership. That is what you need. How did Gandhi turn a violent struggle in India to a nonviolent struggle? How did Martin Luther King turn a violent black American struggle into a nonviolent struggle? How did Nelson Mandela turn a violent struggle into a nonviolent struggle? It's leadership. It is leadership and example. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, uh, one more question. Um, so how, how would you compare um, Gandhiji and Dalai Lama? Because they both are spiritual and political leaders of their people. So um, what is your take on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question. On the one hand, when you think of Dalai Lama, clearly a leader of Buddhism, and clearly somebody who embraces Buddhist thought, but also to somebody who also suffered, uh, you know, because of, uh, of, of, of political, you know, actions. He had to flee from his own country. Uh, India, thanks to Jawaharlal Nehru, gave uh, the Tibetans uh, exile in India. And he has, Dalai Lama has exemplified uh, the importance of nonviolence, uh, empathy, uh, brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, he, and he has spoken uh, largely in, in those categories. And Dalai Lama also happens to be a visiting professor at, at Emory University. So he's played a, a tremendous role. But I think where Gandhi uh, was slightly different, Gandhi took the idea the, uh, to, to actually to political action and, and to social action in a very large way. Uh, but in a way, you could argue Gandhi was a product of his times. There was this big issue of uh, Indian independence, and he create, and he took on the opportunity uh, to, to embrace it and to make it happen. In his own way, Dalai Lama, too, has promoted uh, you know, uh, the, the Tibetan struggle uh, to, to a limited extent. So I think they both have a lot of similarities, but I think Gandhi's impact in the political domain and in the social domain is of very different magnitude. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, Dr. Kalpana has sent a question. Um, so you mentioned about the healthy ego of uh, Mahatma Gandhiji. So 
Um, could you please like explain a bit more about like how this concept could be applied to us and how can we use it in our day-to-day -day life? Yeah, so when you think about it, when you really think about it deeply, when you read his book, you get that feeling, oh my God, this guy has got two qualities. He's an extremely self, in a sense, he has a very strong sense of self and self-belief, which is, which is what ego is. But he was also very humble because he was questioning himself. So there are many examples of his uh, strong, healthy ego. Think about it. He leaves Sabarmati Ashram at the start of Salt March, and he basically says, declares to the world, I will come back with freedom or I will not return to this ashram anymore. That statement shows a tremendous amount of self-belief. He and and Indian independence did not happen after those 22 days, and he does not return to Sabarmati Ashram for the rest of his life. So there was a strong statement. And similarly, you know, even you know, in South Africa, his first speech was shabby. He didn't know how to make a speech. So it was, it was his colleague who teaches him how to speak, and he was ready to learn. And then he was ready to confront the power of the uh, South African police and the South African government. He was happy to be beaten up. He was happy to be, you know, dragged behind a carriage. But he, but he was, he was able to maintain that self-belief. So the other, when you read Gandhi, Thoreau, uh, Tolstoy, you learn something about civil disobedience. Uh, what they ba basically believed in was that for the power of nonviolent movement to succeed, you need a, a strong amount of creativity, where you're coming up with an idea, which will irritate the opponent to the extent of making them becoming violent and angry, but you have, should never lose your cool, should never lose your uh, ability, and you should still show empathy to the other, your opponent. So even, for example, General Smuts, you know, after being in prison, Gandhi comes out, he's being released, he shows a sense of empathy to General Smuts, and he presents to General Smuts a pair of sandals he manufactures in prison. And many, many years later, General Smuts sends back the sandals, uh, to sandals to Gandhi with a note saying, you're a prince among men, uh, here is your, you know, and that's what Smuts says in Gandhi's funeral. He basically says he was a prince among men. So I think in the long run, Gandhi demonstrated this tremendous ability to show faith in himself, be humble and grow, and at the same time, not hit out at the other person. He goes to England, He's walking on the streets cold in, the, in his loincloth when the press man asks him, Mr. Gandhi, are you wearing enough for the, you know, are you, are you dressed appropriately to meet the queen? His answer was, yes, I am wearing uh, enough for both of us. So indirectly, he used humor. He never used humor in a cruel way. He was basically saying, she's very well dressed, I'm not. But that was his way of answering. So he had a tremendous sense of humor. Thank you, sir. Uh, so one last question. We are getting too many questions now. So just one last uh, question from Dr. Subhatra um, Ayer. Um, how much space is there today for behavioral science in the place of mechanical sciences in the education system? And how do we bring that? Yeah, I think this is an extremely important question. As we enter the 21st century, and clearly as I think COVID has shown us, we are entering a century which largely has, is becoming more and more dominated uh, by the physical sciences, the mechanical sciences, the biological sciences, the technological sciences. These are going to produce enormous progress in one sense. But unless we also combine them with, the with a great equal emphasis in humanity, we need the philosophers to think about things. We need the sociologists to think about things. We need the, the behavioral sciences to wonder how you change human behavior. You need the cultural sciences. All of this, I think without that side, we are going to create a rather, I mean, to hate to use this word, a, a violent world, a, a world where you know, there is considerable inequality, et cetera. If you want to create a more empathetic world, a world where everybody benefits the world, great ideas and technological innovations comes to betterment of human society, we have to pay emphasis, equal emphasis to the liberal arts. You know, I, I keep telling myself, I entered medicine at the age of 18, not knowing why I entered medicine. I was a very unhappy medical student. I 
came close to failing in several of my exams because I was not happy at all. But I spent my five years as a medical student being a member of the Theosophical Society, reading advanced books of philosophy, reading a lot of the scriptures, whether it's Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, reading literature, reading poetry. Later in life, I feel that that personal education on liberal arts gave me a perspective that I could not have acquired otherwise. But I think we have to instill the sense of liberal education and we have to fund the liberal education. Liberal education may not immediately translate into capital gains or, or growth in profits, but it's critical. So I would urge large institutions and universities in India to pay attention. If you think of the world, the greatest universities are not just strong in physical sciences, they're also strong in liberal sciences. Oxford University, uh, the University of Chicago, uh, you know, Columbia University, they are very strong in some of those disciplines. It's very important that we do it. Thank you I so much. Questions, you want me to... um, we are getting too many questions. Uh, I think we are running out of time now. So thank you so much uh, for answering all the questions patiently. Um, I'll hand over the session to Dr. Kalpana, who will deliver the word of thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vimal, for moderating the question session. So now we come to the end of the session, and I am honored to propose the vote of thanks. First and foremost, on behalf of everyone, I thank God Almighty for the immense blessings and grace showered on us to conduct this webinar. I express my gratitude to Thiru TSK Meenakshi Sundaram Anna Avergal, Managing Trustee, Sri Avinashalingam Education Trust Institutions, Coimbatore, for permitting us to conduct this webinar. My heartfelt thanks to Bhatma Shri, Dr. P. R. Krishna Kumar Avargal, Chancellor, for his encouragement to conduct this webinar. My sincere thanks are due to Dr. Premavati Vijayan, Vice Chancellor, for her constant support and guidance. My heartfelt thanks to Dr. S. Kausalya, Registrar, who had initiated this webinar and for her keen interest and effective coordination at all stages and for her inaugural address today. A special word of thanks to Dr. Jayanti, Director, Research and Consultancy, convener of this webinar for her valuable suggestions and constructive comments in planning this webinar and for welcoming the gathering. I deem it a great privilege to thank Dr. Vengat Narayan for his acceptance to deliver a talk in spite of his busy schedule. Thank you very much, sir, for your enlightening and inspiring talk. At this juncture, I profusely thank Dr. R.P. Singh, Chairman, University Grants Commission, Ministry of Human Resource Development, New Delhi, for giving us an opportunity to conduct this webinar to celebrate 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. My wholehearted thanks to the University of Reading, United Kingdom for collaborating with us on this intellectual venture on Mahatma Gandhi. My sincere thanks to Dr. Mohan from the Madras Diabetes Research Foundation and his entire team for being an audience for this webinar. My sincere thanks to all the doctors from Coimbatore for attending this webinar. I thank all the deans of various schools, heads of departments and faculty members of Avinashlingam Institute for their participation. A special thanks to Dr. Vasidi, Dean School of Home Science, and to Dr. Tirmani Devi, Professor and Head Food Science and Nutrition, and to all my department staff for their love and support. I place on record my special thanks to Dr. Vimal Karani, Associate Professor in Nutrigenetics and Nutrigenomics, University of Reading, UK, the Overseas Coordinator for this webinar, for all his untiring help, enthusiasm, and coordination of this webinar, and also for arranging the speaker for this webinar. It's my immense pleasure to thank all the participants, including the international participants, representing five continents, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. We have almost 300 registered participants and more than 80 participants are from the international level. 
uh, almost 14 countries, including India, USA, Canada, Trinidad and Tobago, Brazil, United Kingdom, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Nepal, Indonesia, Singapore, Yemen, and Sydney. I thank once again all the international and the Indian participants. Once again, I thank all of you for participating in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank we you. thank Dr. Kalpana for the entire coordination from the Department of Food Science and Nutrition. And Dr. Vimal Karoni, there were two questions that were not from me, from Dr. Jane P. Oh, okay. Just, Sorry, uh, the, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. No words to say. Thank you. Brilliant exposition we had. Science on one side, Gandhiji, and for youth and COVID. Hats off to you, sir, from both sides. And thank you, Dr. Vimal Karoni. Day and night you have coordinated. Thank you. And we will see you later in other webinars. Sir, should sure. come to Paimetu and visit us and do more lectures, perhaps before that in online. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Kalpana. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Dr. Vimal Karoni, Dr. JNT. All the three trio. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.